hello, John. Hi, George. Happy New hey, Year. How are you? Good. Happy New Year. Same to you. How's yours going so far? Oh, pretty good. We got a pretty big snow for Santa Fe, like about a foot of snow just a few days before Christmas. So I was doing a lot of snow shoveling and pouring sand on ice and, you know, glad that I had four-wheel drive. It's one of the, you know, like once or twice a year <laughs> I get to actually use it to good benefit. Uh, we had, um, it's been very cold and wintry here, too. We had uh, yeah. some snow on uh, New Year's Eve, and um, fortunately the pond hockey crew, not including me, got out and uh, shoveled and brought the snow blowers and cleared off this pond called Earl's Pond that we play on a lot, and we had an amazing yeah. game yesterday, really fun. Wow, wow. God, you guys are so serious about this. That's great. It's uh, it's serious fun. Yeah, I need to get out and snowshoe or something because I'm not getting enough exercise. Just snow shoveling exercise. And... Yeah, that, that does it. Just watch out you don't get a heart attack. Well, yeah, you got to be careful, though. You don't want to be one of these you know, 50-year-old people that has um, heart attacks. No, especially you. Some people we would uh, not miss, but, George, you we would miss. Even though <laughs> well, there's some, so I, I wouldn't wouldn't wish that on anyone. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm much better than I was last time I talked to you, and I, you know, I was really kind of I, I posted sort of a semi apologia in the comment section for that dialogue, just you know, basically saying you know that I should know better than to go out in public when I'm when I'm jet lagged. <laughs> well, uh, the irony, George, is that. Uh, of course, you know, Blogging Heads always wants us to boost our traffic or at least uh, mentions on other I know, blog I sites. Know. And, and there's but nothing... I was just kind of epitomizing everything that I was criticizing. So. Well, but, you know, hey, don't take it back. Uh, I thought it was... Um, I thought you, you uh, hit on something very important, which is uh, where do we get informed uh, criticism of conveyance of uh, science these days in the uh, age of the internet. Yeah, when anybody one thing I realized. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I no, I'm not. I, I was reacting to what I still think was just an amazingly uninformed caricature of the profession of science journalism. But uh, you know, by giving this sort of over the top, you know, kind of uh, too two synaptic connections between your vocal cords and the reptilian part of your brain that was just kind of contributing to the low end of you know what's happening on the internet and um, and so many great things are happening and I was also just kind of reacting I think to you know cumulatively to just some really bad you know just all the bad stuff that there is out there and just how rare the real gems are and you know I'm thinking of the spectrum where with science blogging in particular, you go from something like Cosmic Variance, you know, Sean Carroll's, predominantly Sean Carroll's posts, and his wife, Jennifer Ouellette, who does, um, who does cocktail party physics. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is writing. You know, these are people who, um, they're not just sitting down and reflexively typing what, you know, flits across their brains, you know, as quickly as they can to get it out there and to get people reacting, and they're not trying to be purposefully outrageous to get as many clicks and hits on their side as they can to you know get more fame or, or pennies from Google ads or something but they're actually sitting down digesting information thinking about it and then crafting it into prose that just happens to be published on the internet instead of on paper yeah so this has all gotten me thinking about Marshall McLuhan and the medium is the message and all of that and well I uh, wrong. I'm actually I, I'm I'm overwhelmed by the amount of uh, very high-level science blogging out there. So, you, you know, you mentioned uh, Sean Carroll. Uh, there are a whole bunch of people on uh, science bloggers, and I say that not just because of this reciprocal arrangement that... <laughs> that uh, not just because you're supposed to. Blogging no, I agree. Has been science you know, bloggers. afterwards, I actually went on science bloggers a little more and looked around, and somebody had actually done a, you know, like a top top posts of the year that they linked to. It wasn't all science blogs, but I read a lot of the science ones. And Yeah, it's just that what impressed me when the internet first started becoming such a big deal, how many literate, textual people there are out there that can express themselves with words. And these are people that are obviously spending a lot 
of time on blogging. Uh, and some yeah. of them are scientists, and some of them are journalists. I mean, Andy Revkin, the New York Times environment reporter, has a an oh, amazingly yeah, no, high quality blog on the New York Times yeah. website. Carl Zimmer has a wonderful blog, which yeah, is a, Carl. I meant to mention along with my other two exemplars. Yeah, but, they, but yeah, but there's still there's just so much junk. Well, sure, but remember, and I guess that's to be expected. But remember, George, we yeah, as, but it's not just junk. As as, as we've discussed before, is there's the uh, law of conservation of bullshit, so that. No matter how much the uh, <laughs> the information sphere expands because of the internet, uh, there's always the same proportion of bullshit. So there's more bullshit mm -hmm. now, but it, I think the proportion is roughly the same. And I think probably uh, there's more um, high quality stuff there too. If if uh, just because there are more people yeah, talking. Yeah. But you know the thing that yeah, bothered so me. Good. If the thing that bothered me about the uh, the discussion. Of uh, you know scientists versus journalists, um, and it wasn't just um, uh, the discussion between uh, Abby and Ed that set you off initially, but also um, the uh, the follow up by a bunch of people on on science blogs and elsewhere. It can it it perpetuated a model of science communication that drives me absolutely crazy. So it it suggests that. Here you have the scientists who are discovering the truth, and then they have to somehow convey it to uh, the masses. And uh, some scientists can do that themselves, but many of them can't write or are not inclined to write uh, for uh, a popular audience, and so they rely on journalists to do it. But you know the assumption is that there is this thing toward truth, it's this product that's just conveyed out there. To the public, which is ridiculous. I mean, anybody. You mean so? Anybody what, knows what I was criticizing is the journalist is a mere conduit. Right. Is that well, I mean, because what you're talking about scientists. So the, you know, there was this assumption in a lot of the um, the blogging on this whole uh, episode that um, journalists are the ones who hype and distort, exaggerate, fabricate that screw yeah, up right. science this communication. This is what I meant by a caricature of. But it's just, it's crazy. I mean, as you know, any, you know, the first thing you learn when you become well, a yeah, giant... you know how often you'll get, a, you'll, you'll get a scientist that just, you know, starts badgering you with emails, and it's just like high-level, high-pressure salesmanship to get something in the news about their work. Right. I mean, so a lot of the, the big... And sometimes it's good work that deserves that, and then you... A lot of the big, crappy science... Uh, trends of the last century really have been perpetuated by scientists, not by journalists. Yeah. Journalists can be their their handmaidens, but it's the scientists who are really at fault. And and you know, so I have yeah. to bring up some of the things that I've ranted about over the years: string theory and multiverse theory, which I think are um, are and make pseudoscience is, is too strong. But I think it's really a, a, an example of science that's gone off the deep end and has become disconnected from uh, empiricism. That's been perpetuated by people like Brian Greene, who's written a couple of bestsellers on uh, string theory and is a professor of physics at Columbia, by Leonard Susskind, who has written these ridiculous books about Landscape theory, multiverse theory. Oh, they're, they're not. They're they're good books. No, no, they're not. Yeah. <laughs> because the ideas in them are bad. All right, just let me finish my rant. Psycho. Well, I, I think they're good books, but but see the way I take when I'm reading read, reading one of Susskind's books or Green's books, and especially Green is a really good writer, and Leonard Susskind's an interesting. He was a good writer in a different way, but. I just see these really smart people wrestling with these fascinating ideas that are right out on the very edge of what it's possible to know. And I don't feel like they're really being salesmen so much as just, you know, kind of sharing this excitement, even if it might all turn out to be wrong. Well, you can be um, sincere in your bullshit. I think the best bullshitters are those who believe their own <laughs> bullshit. That's that's quite clear. Just another, yeah. something with much yeah. more consequence than particle physics is psychopharmacology. So, uh, mm. it is psychiatrists uh, and uh, drug uh, researchers who have sold us um, on the idea that there is a drug for any kind of mental problem 
that ails us, whether it's uh, anxiety yeah. or shyness. But or that's depression. really the pharmaceutical companies, right? Yeah, but it's the scientists. I mean, do you think it's really the doctors? Absolutely, yeah. George. It's the science, it's the psychiatrists yeah. and doctors in general who are taking money from the drug companies and becoming shills for the drug companies and for the for all these different pro- products. Ah, like, did like you see Prozac. that piece in the Times this week? That, that piece in the Times, they're, you're, they're not yes. getting their Zoloft ashtrays. And, oh, I mean, talk about and, a Band-Aid uh, on a gaping wound. <laughs> Jesus. So that's not journalism. that'll fix the problem? Pardon me? No. <laughs> that is just the most... I immediately looked on eBay to see if I could find a Zoloft clock or something like that for my office. <laughs> I should have. Would be. I should have one of those. So the the book that I I um, I've written about many times that I think typifies uh, this kind of hype about uh, psychiatric drugs was listening to Prozac by Peter Kramer, which came out about 15 years ago and really helped to uh, make Prozac one of the most um, uh, best-selling drugs yeah. in uh, in history. It was a beautifully written yeah. book, very intelligent, mm. with a totally bogus premise, which is that uh, here is a drug that's practically a miracle miracle cure for uh, yeah. garden variety depression and anxiety. Evolutionary psychology is another field that has been sold primarily by scientists like Steven mm. Pinker and David Buss and. And uh, Lena Cosmides and uh, Tubi, her husband. Yeah, um, but again, these are legitimate ideas. They're legitimate ideas. And certainly, but they, evolutionary psychology. But been, like, like anything, you can take it overboard. But uh, so what I'm saying it to seems roll, to me that it's. What I mean again, this is my own personal view of science journalism, which is obviously yeah. idiosyncratic. But I think that science journalists are needed to uh, protect us against some of these gracious claims made for science by scientists who are overly invested in a particular idea or theory. Uh, So... Well, yeah, and I I certainly, I agree with that. And I also agree, though, that just as big an important part of the job is having the ability to use language to explain things and to jump up a couple of levels of abstraction and to make connections and see the big picture. And this is something you're not necessarily equipped to do if you're working down in the trenches doing the very, very important work of bench science. But, you know, also, you know, I use not a very great metaphor, but the idea of uh, trying to appreciate music from the um, yeah. perspective of the phonograph needle. Yeah, that was a great. That was you a know, great. If you're down in the nitty gritty. <laughs> that was a great. If, I, of course, they don't really. If disparity. I wonder when I wrote that how many people understood or even knew what a phonograph needle was anymore. It's I still have a one phonograph. One of those dated cultural references. So let's say the laser beam down in the DVD track or something, but. Again, if you're if you're mired in the nitty gritty, I mean, there's nothing greater than if you have a blog of somebody doing bench lab science, and you can kind of peek over their shoulder and get a sense of that excitement and the frustration of what that's like. And that's what I mean by you know it's really great raw material. And and if your audience is other scientists, you know that's a whole different thing. But when it comes down to someone who can step back and explain that and really get the public interested in how beautiful and important this is, you know, it's often not going to be the person doing the work. Uh, you, know, and, you know, I say that knowing that there's great exceptions. That's, that's, it's very true. Just explanatory ability and uh, ability to um, articulate what can be very complex uh, concepts and uh, procedures. I see that really as sort of a precondition for science journalism. But then, what do you yeah, do? Yeah, and then going with that, that next level that you're talking about, which is being almost like an art critic is to art, or a music critic to music. Yes, that's how. The, you're being I, like a like a science critic, or a or a um, a uh, political analyst. Uh, you know what? Well, yeah, that's another thing. I mean. You know, there there are people, you know, apparently in this this flame war that I'm told erupted after this. I only kind of tuned in on a little bit of it because I really regretted going over the top. But, um, you know, people just basically saying that, you know, all you dinosaurs, you know, working for the media who actually get paid to 
to write are going to disappear and it's all just going to be blogs and it's going to be the real experts putting the word out there and we don't need you journalists. Well, that's and, probably true. You know, <laughs> Sadly enough. You, you, well, you don't think you don't... You, you think that's true. I think... Or you think it's true that's going to happen. I think it's true because of the brutal economic world we're, we're in now and if there's... Oh, I don't think so at all. If there's some people who are willing to I give mean, it I, away I think there's free, a danger of that happen happening and it's easily you know it's easy to get down and think that it will but i mean the you know new, newspapers what are now on paper and magazines are naturally going to to migrate entirely to the internet probably you know within the next 10 years if not sooner and as that happens they're having to completely you know the whole old cost models have just been completely smashed and have to be rebuilt but when this is over, I think there's going to be, you know, I think the New York Times, for example, my old employer, but still, you know, <laughs> unbiased, stepping back, I think I can make a pretty unbiased case that it's going to be one of the ones left standing. Yeah. One of the giants, just because of the sheer quality. Well, that's the question. I mean, you think how much money goes into, goes into doing, I mean, just like a Science Times cover story. Yeah. You know, where you're paying the, you're paying the writer for the story, you're paying editors to read it and say well this is really is this what you meant and then pushing the writer to make it better and better and then you have the writer going back you know but like everything you write you probably read it a hundred times before it goes into print and you're sending email after email to your sources to make sure you got everything right and then you put it in the paper with your fingers crossed and and all the work that goes into the art and the illustrations and the charts and a huge amount of money per word goes into this and I just really don't think that you can compare that to you know somebody sitting down unedited and just writing off the top of their head. But you just you just gave the reason implicitly why that model will be maybe not extinct but extremely rare. So it might be that. You know, is, well, I, uh, are we in a are so we in expensive. a good world if it's just the New York Times and and maybe the Wall Street Journal, just a few places, Scientific American that are that are producing high quality science journalism? You know, there's an analogy here too. Yeah, but I'm not sure you need more than you know, do. You, do you really need more than three or four or five or six? You know, it's um, and there's there, there's obviously a demand for this, yeah. and you know, for all the stuff you can find on the on the web, people are still buying science books or buying all kinds of nonfiction books. You know, there's this need for people who can synthesize. And I think that, you know, the economic crisis has really shown that. Like, when you compare the quality of the coverage, you know, the people like uh, like Gretchen Morgenstern and, are doing um, in, in the Times and then other people in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, to, you know, Slate online to some extent. You know, there's really great things out there and you could never find this by you know just reading you know a scattering of blogs the uh, i guess i'm not really thinking of blogs versus everything else i'm just i'm i'm just thinking in yeah. terms of the diversity of um real uh experienced professional voices obviously that is shrinking it's been shrinking for a while it's not true just of science journalism it's true of uh all forms of journalism. So I just I don't know. Is it just moving into different forms? I just saw um, Jake Weisberg yesterday. He came out and played hockey with us for a little while. He's the oh, uh, he's the editor. I didn't know you knew him. Of, he's the editor of uh, Slate Magazine, and we ended up uh, talking right. about the uh, sorry state of journalism. And he told me that uh, Newsweek, so Slate is owned by Newsweek, Washington Post. Uh, Newsweek yeah. it just closed all its international bureaus. So, mm, right. you know, and that's just an emblem of what's happening to the media overall. So that just yeah, but, means that we're not going yeah, to know but how as many, much. How, how many, yeah, I don't know. But, you know, there, there was a day back, um, you know, when, when the Baltimore Sun, you know, the Chicago Tribune, dozens, or at least uh, maybe not dozens, a dozen you, uh, papers in the United States, you know, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, places like this would have foreign correspondents stationed in Europe and in Asia. And uh, and obviously it's good to have all these different voices and opinions, and, and they're all writing, though, for their separate little insular audiences. And then once you, and partly this was, well, mostly this was because the only way you could get the news was to physically go out to the street and, you know, buy it from the, you know, the kid with the, you know, hawking newspapers or have it thrown onto your, your lawn, 
you know, by someone driving by in a truck, and you just had these little micro audiences, but as the audiences sort of become national in scope, do you really need to have, you know, six, eight, however many people, you know, based in... Um, based in Berlin covering, you know, the developments in, in Germany. I think or diversity even 12 is, people in Iraq. I think diversity is inher- is an intrinsic good for journalism. I think competition is an intrinsic good for journalism. Yeah, journalism is always that, subject to the herd mentality and when you have uh, fewer members of the herd, I think you're going to get a lot of important stories that are just never reported. Journalists will will become more timid. Their companies will become more timid. I see a lot of, I, no, you know, I'm so. hoping that things sort themselves out eventually, but I see a lot of downside, at least in, in the immediate future, particularly when we're going through a period when, when uh, serious investigative analytic journalism is needed more than ever because of all the tremendous social problems that we're facing. Yeah, but we're getting it. I mean, mm. I mean you're certainly get, getting that through the Washington Post and the Times. Mm. And I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And did you really need both? I mean, there's excellent stuff in, in, in Newsweek magazine, and there's excellent stuff in U.S. News and World Report. But, you know, I'm just wondering if, um, you know, the consolidation, I don't know. I'm, I'm obviously torn on it because I agree that the diversity is really great, but I don't think it's all going to go away. I think it's, in some ways, if you have, you know, three or four international English language general news publications that can split up this audience and then figure out a way to get them to pay for the product and and split up this huge advertising market among fewer players that you know maybe you'll have the money for you know even better higher quality journalism than we have now jeez i don't know that's the optimistic side okay i'll i'll um <laughs> i'll go along with your optimism and in addition for now. And, and if you have less diversity from the people at the top you're still going to have all of the you know the people grinding their own personal axes on the blogs, and you can go and, and get a smattering of um, of that to offset what you're getting from the mainstream media, and you're going to have people in the blogosphere reacting to what's done in the mainstream media, and then the mainstream media is going to react to that. That's so. true, and I really think that blogging is going to be more important than ever if you do have this consolidation of, of big-time commercial Media and you know bloggers have well, broken have to some blog big stories. About something you know somebody has to go out there and do the work of gathering information. I mean, I guess you could have a blog where somebody you know moves to uh, Iraq, and of course you have these and and actually you know you know do serious serious reporting and the work of going out and interviewing sources and observing what's going on. But most of it's you know, people reacting to what's being done by the mainstream media. Did you know that none of the big networks have anybody, any full-time people in Iraq anymore? No, I didn't know CBS, that. CBS, NBC, On the ABC. other hand, the New York Times spent, I don't know how much money to actually build a bureau there. Right, but... Uh, you know, completely, you know, staffed. So, and they're doing this even though they're not making any money now because they, you know, fortunately are owned by, by a you know, family that... Uh, you know, realizes that maximizing the amount of profit you can squeeze out of a paper, which <laughs> now may be zero, is is not necessarily the you know the goal that you want to have with your life. Yeah, but I don't know. I'm God still, save I'm the New York optimistic. Times. <laughs> hmm? God save the New York Times. Then you'll be pessimistic. <laughs> no, this they sounds go bad there. because you know that's my former employer there, and I still still love to write for them, but you know. And, it's it's just such a high quality publication, it is, it's and it's amazing. also true so far the Wall Street Journal, and it hasn't succumbed, from what I can see, to uh, Rupert Murdochism and the Washington Post, and, and and in science, Scientific American, Discover. There's just a lot of really, really good things out there, and I'm just not. It's something that's all you know. We talk about this a lot at uh, you know the Santa Fe Science Writing Workshop we have every spring, in which you were. We were honored to have you as an instructor a couple of years ago. Right. Um, I mean, is it really necessary for, you know, say the um, the Denver Post to have its own own full time science writer? 
Um, if they can pick up like the science reporting from the Associated Press or from one of the big papers that syndicates it. And again, it's better if there is. Well, but, I mean, um, you, you know, if, if you want to ask whether things are absolutely justified, then I think uh, you might ask whether the Science Times is really necessary. I mean, most of the stories that they do are just kind of general gee whiz, uh, feature type Science stories. They're, no, they're, that's not they're, true. They're sort of luxuries. They're not. Um, they're not uh, serious. Well, yeah, I'm not talking pieces. about luxuries, but I'm saying that you know, if you have a few sources, uh, you know, of people who are putting out really high quality stuff, and in this day and age, can, this could be distributed nationally in a way that it couldn't back when each paper, you know, had its own um, exclusive little audience. That you know, maybe that's not. I'm not saying it's better than having having a huge number of people doing all of this work and basically writing the same story, but, but um, no, I mean, the stuff, like a, doing a cover piece for Science Times is something that takes two weeks. You know, it's a huge luxury, I suppose, to provide, to spend all that money to pay for this, but it obviously supplies a demand and, um, and um it's a, you know, feeds a purpose. A little tiny, low-paying niche of the entertaining uh, entertainment industry. Okay, George, I will. Um, <laughs> no, what am I? It's more than that. Well, I, we should <laughs> we should pick up on this another time. One of my news, but, uh, New Year's resolutions. But I, I don't be, think you. I don't think you meant meant your characterization of Science Times is the way it came across. No, I love it. I love you know, but but I'm a science junkie. I mean, reading Dennis Overby yeah. on multi-universe. Theory I find highly entertaining, but does the word world absolutely need that? Then you get into a whole discussion of whether the world needs particle well, physics, yeah, I, whether I it needs a large We've kind of gone water. down a rabbit hole here where we're <laughs> we're discussing what we weren't really discussing because yeah. I'm not saying that that if anything's not absolutely necessary that it should go by the way wayside and we won't miss it. I guess what I'm saying is. Um, uh, having a few people doing possibly even higher quality stuff may not be the worst thing in the world, um, you know, as opposed to having lots of people competing and dividing up the market into such little pieces that everyone can just kind of do a, you know, uh, you know, half-assed job at it. As long as we are part of that elite group, George. Okay, here, <laughs> let me, uh, now it's time to switch. Well, I know, there's no way you can <laughs> say that without, and it's going to be harder to get jobs, but... Um, I don't know. In the long run, we I think it's fun. all going to settle into a new um, a new equilibrium, and it's going to be better than before. That's the optimist in me. But I agree that the long run might be like John Cain said, um, you know, we, we we live in the short term, and the long run may be after we're dead or something <laughs> yeah. like that. In the, ro- in the, the long run, run may, may be longer than I'm alive, I realize, and that's the pessimistic side of me. All right, so... But, so we, we were going to talk about... I mean, we were talking about great things on the Internet and science and, you know, partly as an antidote to some of my intemperate comments last time, but did, so you read The Edge. Yes, it's the... Edge.org's question of the year. Yes, the annual question from John Brockman, the uh, the uh, science book uh, impresario. It's got this great site. Uh, edge.org, which we've uh, talked about before, and uh, every year he has a, a question, and he asks this uh, ever-growing stable of uh, people, primarily scientists, but a lot of quasi-science, scientific, uh, scientist pundits as well, uh, to um, respond to this question. The question this year is, what will change everything? And he just posted the responses, I think, um, yesterday. So today we're recording this. Yeah, what will change everything? Yeah, it was a New Year's Day. Made made good New Year's Day reading. Yeah, and I was... He he had a subtitle to his question, too, that kind of, it was what will change everything, but then he said, what game-changing scientific ideas and developments do you expect to live to see? Yeah, um, so I was, I thought it was... So I noticed you were notably absent from the... Yeah, I just was... Dozens uh, of people who responded. I just, uh, I don't know, I couldn't muster the energy. I actually was working on something, and I just couldn't put it in a form that I thought uh, I wanted to uh, make public, but uh, yeah. I can I can talk about it. The uh, What I was working on was, um, so my little uh, buzz sentence was, 
radical transparency will bring about radical disarmament don't you want mm -hmm. to know more yeah 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 <laughs> I, if you could see my face facial, facial expression now you'd see that I'm, I'm I'm intently listening okay radical transparency is um, everybody knows everything about everybody else uh, and this will come about because of um, better and better, uh, more ubiquitous information technologies, communication technologies. So, you know, a kind of emblematic uh, episode was um, the uh, videotaping of Rodney King being uh, beaten by L.A. cops, whatever it was, um, 10, 12 years ago. So it was sort of uh, citizen surveillance, Whoa. and that's become much more common now. So common, in fact, that the... Um, that the cops all, uh, a lot of police departments are now videotaping all their encounters with people because they're assuming that they are being videotaped uh, in right. return. So the idea is that instead of having uh, intelligence in the hands of uh, elite secret groups like the CIA or FBI or, or KGIB, intelligence surveillance becomes very grassroots and uh, universal mm. and omnidirectional, there is absolutely... So Big Brother is you. Big Brother is you. It's everybody. So uh, yeah, that's, everyone. that's how you bring, bring about radical transparency. And uh, th so the objection to um, military disarmament has always been, well, if we disarm, how do we know that uh, another nation isn't secretly building up its military even if they promise to disarm or how do we know that there isn't some uh, transnational group or uh, apocalyptic cult that's building some kind of uh, armament or weapons of mass destruction, nuclear weapons, biological weapons. With this kind of ubiquitous intelligence, it will become uh, impossible, pretty much, for yeah. uh, people to secretly build up some kind of uh, destructive arsenal or army and therefore it will make it much more uh, possible for not complete disarmament because we'll always need some kind of uh, police force I think with um, with weapons for extreme situations if we just have psychopaths or running around with uh, machete or something but I think it will mean that we can have um, demilitarization of uh, of all nations, or at least reduction to the point where we have um, only self-defense capacities, and all those resources that we now invest in uh, in the military can be diverted to all those other things that we really need help with: education and energy infrastructure, and and uh, combating uh, overpopulation and poverty, and all those sorts of things. So that's uh, wow. basically it. Radical now, now that, was opti that was optimistic. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, some things I'm pessimistic about, like science <laughs> journalism. And, uh, but yeah, I have my little weird uh, optimistic uh, obsessions. No, too. I think that's that, that's great. I wish, actually, I'm kind of glad you didn't write about it in this forum because there's just so much to read and you don't have that much space but you should really really write something at length about that yeah I'm, I'm thinking I mean, of, it's like I'm thinking of doing something on it be, and there has been you know well, it fits in with your whole whole uh, end of war theme yeah um, you know I actually got this idea for uh, sort of two-way spying or grassroots spying from an article in the New York Times magazine a couple of years ago on something called Intellipedia which is a uh, mm -hmm. this kind of Wikipedia-like system, a website for sharing of information among all the U.S. intelligence services. And this is to overcome right. the uh, communication barriers that prevented them from spotting the 9/11 plot in advance. And you know, of course, no. this is still a classified, uh, closed system for people. Uh, in the FBI and CIA and places like that. I'm thinking in terms of a really open source uh, grassroots Wik Wikipedia. Oh, hold on a yeah. sec. Just had to. Uh, so it's Big Brother. Just say, I don't know how. How the hell to turn this thing off? <laughs> 
Well, so what you're describing is, well, we'll just ignore Hello. it. No one is available to take your call. Please leave a message after the tone. I just... <laughs> I just unplugged it, and it's still making noise. It's the attack of the machines. Wow. So anyway, see, this this is this is like yeah, this is like my experience in Spain two weeks ago, where the technology takes over. And, <laughs> yeah. But uh, so what you're describing it, it it reminds me of Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon, except everybody gets to um to to look in the eye of the video camera. Yeah, it's it's uh it's sort of a benign version well, of the Panopticon. Video. Uh, or a grassroots panopticon, um, and it's you know again. So most of the um, science fiction depictions of uh, surveillance are along the lines of Big Brother in, in 1984, or uh, right. there's a Philip Dick uh, novel, Minority Report, about um, mm-hmm. a government that has the ability to anticipate. Uh, crimes and uh, to sort of read people's minds and determine whether they're going to uh, commit a crime in the future. And again, that's kind of uh, this uh, really creepy, scary... It's all top-down in these... Yes, top-down. ...these dystopian fantasies. So you're talking... It's more like crowdsourcing in journalism, where you have a swarm of people going to some event like the Democratic Convention and then all kind of exchanging... Information back and forth, you know, sort of like, um, you know, like, like like ants, and then and then some kind of structure emerging from this. Yeah, yeah I think it's information. going. I think it's going to happen anyway, and I think it's even possible that you could have um, remote sensing technologies. You could have uh, this network that includes very sophisticated devices, satellite uh, sensing, yeah. sensing of. Um, Radioactive releases that might indicate somebody's building a nuclear bomb. You could have data mining that uh, looks for purchases of materials that could be used for uh, chemical or biological warfare. Yeah. So um, all stuff that's happening now, but it's only with people who um, have the access or the computer technology. But this is going to become grassroots, you think? Right, and I think that governments will realize that it's in their interest to contribute to this instead of fighting it. And so then... To, to break the barriers, you mean to let it go? Yeah. Let it go mainstream? So should everybody... Should, should I be able to like look up anybody's like credit card transactions? And yeah, I think so. Curiosity? And, I, and it also would mean so that it's there's... The death, so it's the death of privacy. The death of privacy. But our kids don't but something, care about... The death of privacy and the end of war. Yeah. <laughs> it's the upside of the death of privacy is that yeah. uh, there will be no... Um, you get you get uh, enormous security from knowing that... Um, I mean, it, it's a wonderful form of, uh, of deterrence. Instead of saying that I will blow you up if you try to make a nuclear bomb, uh, you're deterred from even doing it in the first place because everybody will know about yeah. it at, at your first step. So, so it's a very biological metaphor because really in an organism that's kind of almost exactly what it is. You have all these little processes that are monitoring each other. Yeah. And all these little correctional, you know, feedback loops, and then you get these this homeostasis and and evolution from that. But uh, so this is I don't know. You know, people just it's it's fascinating. Well, the, the image, but there were there were. Um, there were a bunch of uh, responses to the edge question along the lines of, you know, the, the web is going to produce some kind of super intelligence or it's going to create the education that we've always dreamed of. It will enhance uh, human wisdom in all sorts of unimaginable ways. And um, I didn't see anything along the lines of, of what I'm talking about. I mean, there will have to be procedures for false alarms. It's really alarms. an interesting twist, yeah. So anyway, so what, but, what about... I don't know. It's I guess what bothers me is, too, is one is that people care passionately about their privacy. Yeah. And I think overly so. Right. But I, I, I think I'm a minority minority in that, that regard. Um, and also, people are always going to figure out a way to cheat. Yeah. 
Um, you know, I was thinking about that, that you know, one of Natalie Angier's columns recently in the Times about just how ingrained evolutionarily um, the uh, art or vice of deception is. Right. You know, all these stu- you, you you have to lie in order to survive. I guess is the idea. Well, there will always be deceive. garden variety forms of cheating. I, I guess the question is whether we can eliminate. Uh, Cheating that is that has the intention of ultimately doing harm to others or threatening others with physical harm as a way of gaining power. Yeah. And I'm hoping that. But aren't you always going to get like two people will get together and say, well, hey, you know, you know, we could really take advantage of this system if we just figure out a way to, you know, to way to circumvent some little little tiny piece of it, and then you get three or four people to say, yeah, it would really be to our advantage to work with you to game the system and, and cheat, and it seems like there would be just as much of a of a evolutionary kind of force arising among gangs of people getting together to cheat, and you'd get back to kind of what we have now. Uh, I would hope that... Um that uh, certainly the more people that would join a group like that, the uh, more likely it would be that it would be uh, exposed. I mean, that's the whole point of the, the, uh, yeah, the network yeah. that I'm talking about. Um, and I think there will be cultural, I certainly hope there will be cultural changes that go along with this technological change that's happening anyway. The cultural changes would make it seem absurd for people to want to gain power in this primitive way through force, through threatening others mm. with physical harm. I mean, it's, yeah. this is... I don't know, it just seems like the, our, our whole history with, with uh, economic markets kind of argues against human nature going that way, but... Oh, economic competition will certainly uh, still exist, unless we yeah, go it's toward... It's really kind of based on the same... Basic forces in it. Any, anyway, I'm 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 willing to give it a chance. Okay. Well, how about what else did you see in this site? <laughs> yeah, let's talk about some of the other. You know, you know, there were I don't know how many dozen of these responses, and and just so many of them, just you know, very you know, well written, intelligent prose, and um, there were a few that I noted that really that really struck me. Yeah, go for it. I mean, one was you know, some of these things were hundreds of words. Long and, and could have um, you know benefited from being edited, I think. But but most of them were really great. But um, the one, one that really struck me um, was John Barrow, the Cambridge University physicist, who just said a really really good battery <laughs> right. is going to change everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I almost but, wish I thought. But of that. there was one that uh, our, our colleague Char- Charles Seif, yes, who's apparently now a professor, a journalism professor at. Uh, at NYU, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and this kind of fits in with what we were talking about earlier, but he, I mean, he also wrote this this book, Zero, about the number zero and the history and culture. Mm-hmm. And his was really one of the ones that struck me the most. He said that there are one, there are some hundred million blogs and the number is roughly doubling every year. The vast majority are unreadable. Several hundred billion email messages are sent every day Uh, Most of it is spam. There seems to be a Malthusian principle at work. Information grows exponentially, but useful information grows only linearly. Ah. That's, uh... And that's the kind of thing that makes me think there's a future for journalism. That seems like a, um, a kind of twist on the conservation of bullshit idea. So he's saying that the proportion of bullshit (laughs) actually grows... As a percentage of total volume, that's hmm, that's kind of yeah. scary. So it's harder. That's, to... that's been my my impression of of the blogosphere. Yeah, I guess. Uh, well, I guess that and would be really true. Look hard to find someone like Sean yeah. Carroll. Well, that's true. As, so as more rank amateurs get into it, then I guess uh, it would make sense that the uh, proportion of of bullshit, uh, bad quality stuff also grows. Um, well, yeah, because there's this tendency to, you know, to shoot from the hip, and instead of sitting down and thinking for a day and digesting and then constructing, you know, taking your thoughts and expressing them in words, sentences and sentences crafted into paragraphs and paragraphs into essays that you just you just kind of type. Well, so I guess... Th- you know, it reminds me of, you know, there's fr- Truman Capote's famous comment about Jack Kerouac's On the Road. Uh, I think he said this on the Johnny Carson show, that it's 
not writing, it's typing. Oh, he could have picked and up someone what, other than Jack Kerouac. It, um, I, I No, I was going to say, I really admire Jack Kerouac, and I loved On the Road, but I was thinking that the equivalent so often in the blogosphere is, that's not writing, it's texting. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and yet it's out there forever and never goes away. But anyway, that was one that, that really struck me, and, and there was... Um, There's another guy. Another one that picked up on this theme by um, Marty Hurst. Yeah, the I was going to mention that. At Berkeley who writes about the, oh, the decline of text. Right. Yeah, that was, yeah. so he's saying that um, young people nowadays are attuned to uh, video and audio and uh, and much more so than to uh, text. And uh, so he thought that media in the future would um, be, uh, the text wouldn't disappear entirely, but it would become much less important as a form of yeah. uh, information conveyance. And yeah, uh, yeah. Well, we got a whole long conversation about that because I definitely don't agree. Yeah, but I don't agree either. I'm not sure. I think it's possible to really think and to entertain complex thoughts and uh, competing ideas in your head and to really think analytically without doing it textually. But you know, there's a let's uh, talk about that another time. What's another one that struck you? Um, Nassim Taleb. He's the black swan guy. He's. Um, yeah. I, I sort of um, am beginning to appreciate him as a fellow uh, crank. Um, so he <laughs> he talked about something called iatrogenic science. I, I hope I pronounced that iatrogenic, right. Iatrogenic, right? Iatrogenic. So usually you hear the phrase iatrogenic medicine, and that's when uh, medicine, the treatment itself, uh, is harmful. And so there are many people yeah. who die or are severely injured every year um, because of the treatment they get in a hospital or from a doctor or taking uh, a wrongly prescribed drug yeah. and that sort of thing. Or almost anyone who goes into a hospital after they're over 70 years old is probably going to get pneumonia. Right. I mean, it seems that way. Well, it's so he a large percentage. He thinks that this um, this concept should be applied to science as a whole. And, uh, you know, he comes at this from uh, economics, and he's talked about the tremendous harm that's, that's been done to various economies, including ours, quite recently by these very sophisticated, supposedly scientific uh, models. And he said there are many other instances where... Uh, well, you know, the computer models where you put your faith in a model you don't understand. Yeah, and he says there are other cases mm. where um, excessive faith in a scientific theory or model which is supposed to help us ends up uh, harming us. And he's, he says this comes from a, a failure of scientists and the public to recognize the limits of science. And uh, that's mm -hmm. something that I appreciated and have tried to uh, address in my own work. Yeah. Um, there's another guy named Carl Sabog. I forget where he's mm -hmm. from. I've seen his name before. And he had, this is again, is sort of an end-of-war um, uh, response. He thinks that uh, violence will be wiped out because we will modify our brains with chips or genetically uh, so that violence is impossible. We just can't commit it. We, we don't have those mm -hmm. cognitive uh, programs anymore, and he talked about the possible consequences of this, and this is actually a really old idea. I've, I, I think I've talked before um, on this program about a uh, Yale scientist, neuroscientist named uh, Jose Delgado, who in the late 60s um, wrote a book talking about how chips in the brain could uh, remake humanity and eliminate violence in the future. So, yeah. um, I think that's... I don't know. Very unlikely, uh, but it's interesting that um, that that idea has popped up again. I mean, one thing that I noticed there was, there was a fair number that that was a theme that came up in a lot of them. This idea of modifying our brains in order to improve society and yeah, um, a lot of transhumanism, uh, a lot yeah. of artificial the intelligence. Sing that's the singularity stuff. Right, the yeah. singularity, uh, genetic engineering. Yeah, I read some of those, and I just imagined you... <laughs> yeah, scoffing. <laughs> imagined you cringing. 
Uh, but some of it is far out, so Freeman Dyson and a couple of other people, there were clumps of ideas. Uh, several people, including Freeman Dyson, talked about um, brain chip telepathy. So if in the future right. you will have a chip in your brain that instantly picks up uh, your thoughts and transmits, transmits them uh, wirelessly to the brain chip that I have, and um, right. you know we could just um, have a, uh, a mind meld in this way and get rid of this very narrow width. Yeah, radio telepathy, I think you called it. Right. You know, and that fit in with all of this. You know, that was another theme that came up that we're going to crack the neural code, which I know is something that you're really interested in. That I'm. Yeah, that, Gary Marcus, you know, NYU. I don't know. Decoding the brain. Right. Um, yeah. So we're going to be able to decode the brain, not you know. And have this uh, remote mind reading where you can scan people's brains and get your thought, get their thoughts. And then now Dyson's taking it another level where you can transmit them to other people. And I don't know. That's that's um, I, th I think not in my lifetime. I don't. Think, what I know about the neural code uh, leads me to believe that any kind of really the kind of communication that we're having right now uh, is not going to happen with uh, via. Uh, brain chips. I mean, you already have really mm -hmm. rudimentary forms of communication where uh, a quadriplegic can control a computer, um, sort of move a cursor around and, uh, and get the computer to do various commands, but um, that's a far cry from uh, real uh, significant uh, communication. Yeah. Um, I, I just can't imagine that there really is going to be a neural code in the same sense that there's a genetic code. Well, I think the, the, uh, the people who know... And I still don't have the sense that maybe the neural code for every individual is going to be different. The people who know most about it say that that's the case. Not only that, but the neural code for each person keeps changing as a result of experience. There may be many the different neural codes for different forms of memory, for different... Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, senses. So maybe code's not even the right metaphor for it. Yeah. But um, I mean, you know, with the genetic code, it's ba you know, you basically have molecular shapes. Right. You know, giving rise to other molecular shapes through you know this three-dimensional recognition, and it's just hard to imagine how you're going to have something even vaguely equivalent to that for the mind. You know, I was struck among these edge comments, one by Rupert Sheldrake. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, who usually I kind of dismiss as this, you know, sort of new age, new age ESP, you know, uh, what, what's his... Um, oh, uh, uh, how your... Biomorphic... Uh, yeah, morphogenic fields, um, how your... Mo morphogenic fields, right. Morphogenic fields, where if one kid learns to play guitar like Eric Clapton, it will, the talent will, um, will uh, radiate through the morphogenetic field, and we have this kind of collective knowledge and some kind of non-material field surrounding the Earth. So usually I don't, you know, I kind of think Rupert Sheldrake's ideas are, you know, pretty... Pretty, uh, <laughs> pretty off, but uh, he wrote a really nice little essay called The Credit Crunch for Materialism. I thought that was the single best headline of any of these responses. The Credit Crunch for Definitely. Materialism. That's inspired. And then he says, credit crunches happen because of too much credit and too many bad debts. Right. Credit is literally belief from the Latin credo, I believe. Once confidence ebbs, the loss of trust is self-reinforcing. The game changes. And then he's basically saying, well, materialism, and I'm, and I'm sure he grants that all kinds of wonderful things have come out of the materialist approach to science, but he's saying that there's been so many things it hasn't achieved that we need to look for, you know, something extra beyond the material world, you know, which is an idea that I usually, you know, write um, or oppose, you know, rather, rather... Um, Forcefully, but uh, he t tells tells this wonderful story about Francis Crick and Sidney Brenner mm -hmm. back in 1963, which would have been ten years after Watson and Crick's paper on the on the double helix. And they're basically the attitude as um, Sheldrake describes it. He's talking to them, I think, in um, I think it was at King's College in Cambridge, and he's saying, "Well, you know, we've tracked the genetic code, and now we're so smart, we're going to go on and." crack the codes of uh, biological development and then consciousness mm -hmm. and you know and then here we are 
45 years later, and of course that hasn't happened, and then to Sheldrake, that's an example that, you know, we have to, you know, go beyond this materialist approach, and well, actually, I don't take the lesson to be that, but uh, it's a kind of a reminder, and then you talk about the neural code, and yeah. this is something that's really crackable. Well, and he also talks about how physics, which is the foundation of materialism, supposedly, has gone off the rails into uh, higher dimensions and uh, multiple universes and string theory and uh, all that stuff. So he makes some points. Well, that, yeah, there uh, he's right. You're right in the cord. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I agree with you that, uh, you know, actually there were several responses along the lines of old science is dead, let's welcome the new science. So Stu Kaufman had a piece like that, which was sort of reprising some of uh, the things that he said about um, a science of emergent systems. Uh, so he said right, that we've discovered right. that the universe is open. Uh, and, you know, so th there were there were actually two sets of responses. One saying that uh, we will, P.C. Myers, for example, said something along the lines that neuroscience will, will finally stamp out all these silly super, superstitious ideas we have about um, the soul and people will become rational and accept yeah. the science's story of the universe and reject all this uh, superstitious nonsense. And then you had a whole other set of responses saying exactly the opposite that uh, we're going to recognize the inadequacies of uh, science and embrace some new airy fairy new age science that allows us to believe in ESP and angels and leprechauns and God and yeah. <laughs> well, then you had there was a lot of real pessimism, and then people saying the thing that's going to change everything is when someone finally uses a nuclear weapon. Yeah, a nuclear weapon or Greenland. The Greenland ice cap melts. And, oh, yeah, uh, the climate stuff. And, yeah, and, a lot of it was really, really grand. Yeah, and then some people... different from what you usually get on these edge questions. And then some people said, um, really, nothing will change. So there are a couple of people mm -hmm. who resisted the whole premise of uh, of the question. And, and you know, I, I know what they mean. It's sort of the... How, in spite of all these technological marvels, that, the you know, our ability right here to be... Uh, taping this uh, this thing and it's going to be posted tomorrow on the internet for uh, any fortunate person to see uh, our lives have changed in so <laughs> many ways and yet you know the but yet not really the structure yeah. of life sort of our that our the human need for love and and uh, the uh, great likelihood of heartbreak all the ways that people find joy and suffer um, those are really unchanging. Um, yeah. The fact that you can read a novel or something before a novel written hundreds of years ago and then communicate and empathize with another human mind across all those centuries. And, and of course, change is accelerating, but still, I think there's a basic core. Yeah. So the question is whether... You know that great um, Arthur C. Clarke novel, Childhood's End, in which mm. there's a new, there um, the children, parents just start noticing that their children are just strange. They're different, and uh, so it's sort of a refutation of what we're saying here. There is a new generation that is completely unlike any other, and, um, and sometimes I wonder if my kids really are like that. If they're Brains are. <laughs> if they, they seem alien to you. Well, they. It's just you know because they are, they they really are hybrid sort of flesh and blood, electronic device beings. You know because they're so <laughs> they're so, they always have the iPod, the cell phone. My son has a an iTouch, and then the you know the laptops. Um, they are so plugged in. They're texting. They're do, doing video yeah. conferencing, uh, calling each other constantly, um, and that I think that is having a profound effect on. I mean, this is you know. Yeah, and your lives are on Facebook, and yeah, this is what we were talking about before. I really think that the concept of privacy means something entirely different to them than it did to yeah. us. So, yeah. 
I guess I'm taking There's back... the cult of privacy that there is in our generation. So I guess I'm taking back what I just said. Although I still think that they, you know, they need love, their hearts can be broken. Those things... Um, will still still be there, but maybe the... Um, yeah, there will be st- and you sit down one and one and have a conversation, and it's really, you know, it's not like you're you're talking to an alien, right? Well, sometimes, actually. Not or entirely. <laughs> not entirely, no. <laughs> uh. Well, yeah, so maybe, yeah, the post-textual, we should talk more about post-textual future and this idea, and I, getting back to McLuhan, of whether the medium really is the message, if, or to what degree writing posted electronically is different from writing on paper, and my short answer is I don't think very much. It's good and there's bad, but, you know, that's a long subject. Do you know how to text yet, George? Text, oh, text. no. God, when I was in... Um, in Germany, the assistant who was helping me out sent a text message to my cell phone from the airport saying she'd been delayed. It took me like 15 or 20 minutes to figure out how to respond and just say, okay. <laughs> That's great. George, you are a dinosaur. I agree with all oh, those no. young whippersnapper bloggers out there. Of course, uh, at least you yeah, said them. Yeah, I'm gnawing at my ankles. The, <laughs> the next generation or the next... Uh, the next transhuman species or something. but uh. It is our role, it is our destiny to um, to be grouchy curmudgeons saying snarky things about these young people oh, coming up. Not. And, uh, <laughs> no, because that gives them you pleasure to. pull down the fort, though. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> you know, sometimes I don't think people appreciate when we're being ironic, but <laughs> I think there's also the death of irony. Right. That's that's actually been a uh, persistent theme of uh, my life is that um, people don't get my uh, get my irony, including people in my family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, fuck them if they can't take a joke. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess we've we filled up another hour here. It's a miracle. First one of two thousand and yeah, something. Yeah, or uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> won't uh, think of an opposite characterization, but um, yeah, so let's do this again in a couple of weeks, do you think? Sounds good, George. And um, Sounds good to me, too. I, once again, uh, Happy New Year. I'm glad I could bring it in with another chat with you. Yeah, it was good. I enjoyed it, and you know, I really urge people to go look at these edge things, because there's really, you know, there's really some interesting ideas out there, including some new ones. Yeah, yeah, me too. I really enjoyed looking at them. All right, man, I'll talk to you soon. Okay. See you.